All right, uh, next I'd like to take a look at the principles of impulse and momentum. Uh, we have an analogy between work and energy and impulse and momentum. Remember before we saw that work essentially was forced through a distance. and it was equal to the integral of f dot dx. Um, and that was equal to a change in energy. Okay, so whenever we look at problems that involve a force that is distance dependence, that's acting through a distance, we want to think in terms of work and energy. Well, what if we have a time dependent force f of t, and we define the impulse then as being uh, force through time. Or here, we can call f the average force and delta t is the time over which the force acts. then this is often called the impulse approximation. Uh, because uh, what we're doing here is we're saying that even though the force might not be constant at all times over which the force is acting, the average force, if we can find that average force multiplied by the time, uh, will give rise to what we call here the, is the impulse. Now you might wonder why are we using I for impulse? Well because I has already been taken. It's going to be moment of inertia later on. And so we use J instead of I for impulse. But in some texts I have seen uh, I used. And so impulse then is a vector rather than being a scalar, as was the case with work. Work involved two vectors, but it's a dot product of those two vectors. So it ended up being a scalar, and energy was a scalar. So the question then is, well, what is force times change in time? If we write force times delta t as mass times acceleration, and then acceleration we can write as dv dt, or for the average, let's do this for the average force, then that's equal to mass times average acceleration, which is delta v over delta t. Okay. Because the average force is just, we have, uh, <clears throat> velocity function, V versus T, then uh, dV dt is the uh, instantaneous acceleration, but delta V is just the uh, slope of the chord that joins those two lines. So when we want average acceleration, then we can write that as delta V, delta T. Then we multiply that by delta T, and that just gives us M delta V, or that's just M times V final minus V initial. Okay, so if we want to follow with the same kind of mathematics that we did with the work energy, we could then say, well, what is the impulse, the change in? Well, we could define momentum as being the thing that changes. And if you define momentum as mass times velocity, then our impulse, J, is going to be equal to mv final minus mv initial. Or we can write that as p final minus p initial. And since the impulse is a vector, then the momentum is also a vector as well. Okay, so this is a way then to connect 
the force function and the time over which the force acts by the change in momentum. So we get here F delta T in our impulse approximation. And so this then is equal to the change in momentum. So let's look at a problem like the one up on the data projector in which we have a car that's moving to the left at minus 15 meters per second. And minus here just means that we are defining the direction that's to the left as being our negative direction. And then it bounces off of that brick uh, wall and then um, comes back with a final velocity of 2.6 meters per second. And then let's find in this problem the average force of the wall on the car. So here's our initial velocity. We can define that as minus 15. Now I'll, I'll explain why. We're going to make it negative in a second. Hits the wall. And so while the wall is in contact with the car, there's a force that's exerted on the car, and so that by the time that that changes the direction of the velocity vector until it gets to V final, which is uh, 2.6 meters per second. And let's find the average force of the wall on the car. Okay, so this is the reason then why we're defining the positive direction to be to the right. That's the direction of the final momentum vector. And as it's coming in, it's going to be moving in the negative direction with respect to this positive force which is acting. Okay, and so what we can do then is we can write, and let's say that during the contact, delta t, is equal to 0 0.5 seconds. And the mass of the car, let's say, is equal to 2,000 kilograms. Okay, so we have enough information then to solve for the average force of the uh, wall on the car during the collision. So we can do that using our impulse momentum equation, right? This is F times 0 0.5 seconds equals M, which is 2,000 kilograms, times V final, which is uh, 2.6 meters per second, minus a negative the initial. So that's going to make this positive because V initial is negative here. And so we want to be careful when we do this that we don't just take the 15 and subtract the 2.6 from it. Okay? Because here, first, the mass has to slow down to zero, then it has to speed back up to 2.6. So that means that the change in the velocity is going to be 15 plus 2.6. Okay, and so that's what happens when we subtract the negative in this way. And that gives rise to a positive force. And so that's the most consistent way to do this. We could have defined this direction as positive, but then the force that would come out would be negative. And I believe it would be a little more confusing to follow. But we don't want things to be confusing for the wrong reasons. There's enough right reasons for things to be confusing. Okay, so here we're going to have this times 15 meters per second. All right, and so we can uh, uh, group together and solve for the force. So that will give us our force is equal to, well, this is going to be 17.6 uh, times 2,000. divided by uh, 0 0.5 seconds. So that's going to be, what? This is going to, 
be another factor of 2, so that'd be like 4,000 times 17.6. which gives us uh, 7, uh, 0.04 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Okay, so that'd be, what, 10 to the 5 is 100,000, so that'd be like 70,400 uh, newtons. Uh, of force is being exerted by the wall on the car. And while this ha is happening, the car can get damaged. Its surface can be deformed. Uh, and, but if we tried to use the energy equation on this, some of the energy would go into deforming the metal. But by using impulse momentum, we don't have to worry about how much energy is lost because we never lose any momentum. And I'll explain that more clearly as we go. But it turns out that this is a better w uh, way to solve a problem in which some unknown amount of energy is lost. Uh, and uh, uh, so we might wonder then, well, uh, if the person in the car is experiencing this kind of a force, uh, is this something that could cause injury over that period of time? At 70,000 newtons, that's being um, delivered essentially to the entire car, including the passenger that's inside. And so let's find the acceleration, of, or the average acceleration, I should say, of the car. A average is equal to F average divided by M. So that would be 7.04 times 10 to the 4 newtons divided by uh, 2,000 kilograms, and we'll see how big this acceleration is. Remember that it's acting for about a half a second. Okay, so that gives us uh, 35 meters per second squared. So that would be then, what, three and a half times the acceleration due to gravity. Okay, and so this looks like it's not going to be a life-threatening collision under these conditions. Uh, but it would still give you a good jolt. And uh, it might be advisable to uh, uh, have your airbag deploy. Okay, so if your airbag deploys, then that means that you're actually slowing down uh, at, over a longer time period because the car stops and then changes direction but while that's happening the airbag is causing you to compress into it over a longer period of time and so that means essentially then that uh, uh, if the airbag deploys uh, you uh, would feel less acceleration and this also why padded dashboards are useful is that your head hits it and uh, that doesn't just suddenly bring your head to rest, but there's a certain extra amount of time that is associated with the compression of the, uh, uh, the pad and dash. And uh, so then that uh, creates perhaps a little less injury to your head. All right, so this is the way that we can work with uh, impulse as being change in momentum for a problem in which all we're interested in is the average force. But what if we had a force that changes as a function of t? Okay, so this, all this means then, it's not force times time here, we're just saying that the force is a function of time. Okay, so if that is the case, then you can say that J is equal to the integral of F times dt from some initial time to some final time, from T initial to T final. And so we can see then how that would look up here on the data projector. Let's say that we have a baseball 
that is being hit by a bat. Okay, so here we see the ball being compressed to its maximum point. And so clearly at that point, the ball is um, having more force being imparted to it at that moment than when the ball is less compressed. Okay, so there is a time of contact, but not all times of contact correspond to the same amount of compression of the baseball. Okay, and so if you plotted this out as force versus time, here when you reach this peak point, that would be the point where the baseball is most compressed by the bat. But this is the point where the bat first comes in contact with the ball, and so the force isn't as great because it hasn't compressed the ball by as much. And then it should be symmetric on the way back out with the force dropping as the ball leaves the bat. And so what we can see then is that this integral of f dt is just the area under the force versus time curve. And that's equal to our, uh, our impulse. Okay, and so if we want to plot up the force versus time, get something, say, that looks like this, then this area from t initial to t final is going to be the impulse. And so what is that here then? If we're talking now not about the average force, but about the instantaneous force as a function of time. Well, then we can write that the integral of f dt is going to be uh, dp dt times dt, where, and let's just kind of introduce this, since we have momentum now, it might be useful to write the force in terms of the momentum. And so how can we do that? Well, force is equal to mdv dt, but um, this is the same as dp dt, because p is equal to mv, and so dp dt is first times the derivative of the second, plus second, which is v, times the derivative of the first. But assuming that, now this isn't always true, because we can have a dm dt term, say, in a rocket problem where the fuel is being ejected out. But uh, in a lot of situations, uh, V dm dt is, is zero because the mass is the same before and after. So here we assume no mass change in this expression. So we see then that the derivative of the momentum with respect to time can be written as the force. And so this is a very important connection <coughs> to make between force and momentum. <coughs> so I can put that in here, then I can cancel out the dt's, and this just gives me the integral of dp from p initial to p final. So that's just p final minus p initial, because the integral of dp is just p, just the momentum, evaluated between the final and the initial points. So we see then that this more general expression for the impulse as the area under the force versus time curve is uh, equivalent to the expression that we get for the impulse as being the change in the momentum in the impulse approximation. And so how do those two connect? Well, if we go back up to the data projector, we see that if you are able to find an average force for a problem, basically what you're doing is you're finding a force such that if that constant force acted for the whole time, it would give you the same area under the curve as the area under the curve that you get for your constantly changing force. And so given that you can do that, then you um, you've satisfied the impulse approximation. But it's just an approximation based on 
you being able to find an average force that is approximately the same as the actual area under the curve. And so either one works uh, as long as you have an average force that gives rise to the same area under the curve as you would have <coughs> as you um, would have for the actual continuous force that's acting. Okay. But in some situations, we're more interested in looking at the force itself uh, and how it varies over time and finding the area under that curve. And so this is a more precise way. This is an approximation, but this is the more precision way to figure out impulse and relate it to change in momentum. So let's look at an example where the uh, the force is a time-dependent function. Now, before I, I get farther into this, let me just be really clear that if your force is a distance-dependent function, like what we had in the previous chapters with work and energy, then you don't want to go this way. Or you need to rewrite the force <coughs> using parametric equations as a function of time. So if it's a function of displacement, you want to use work and energy, typically. But if it's a function of time, you want to use impulse and momentum. So that's something I'm not going to tell you on a quiz or an exam. You're going to have to know that from the way that I write the force function. So if I write the force function, say like this, 3 plus 2t, then you, this is cluing you into the fact that you want to use impulse and momentum rather than work and energy. But if I wrote it as a function of x, like I had done in an example that we looked at in the last section, then you'd want to use work and energy, typically. Okay. And there are other factors that are involved in, in which way you want to go with this, too. But uh, um, that is kind of a, a first line of defense <laughs> in, in, in knowing which way to go with the problem, is to know that a time-dependent force use impulse and momentum. Okay, so I hope I've driven that point home because that's something that I found in the past tends to uh, come up as being a source of significant error on quizzes and exams. So here, let's say that this is the force that's given for this example. And furthermore, let's say that the, uh, the force acts between t equals 0 and t equals 1 second. Okay, and let's assume that it acts in the same direction that the object is originally moving. So here we have a v naught. Let's say v naught here is 2 meters per second. The mass, let's say, is equal to 2 kilograms. And let's apply this time-dependent force to this mass with an initial velocity at time equals 0 of 2 meters per second. And let's find the final velocity at t equals 1 second. Okay, so we can do that here by just integrating the force function and setting that equal to the change in momentum. Okay, so remember that we got the integral of f dt. It doesn't have to be a dot product here because it's a force uh, is a vector times a scalar is just a vector. So this will be from t equals 0 to 1. And that'll equal mv final minus mv initial. Okay, so since m is given and v initial is given in this problem, all else we have to do is find the area under this curve. So let's go back over and draw this particular force function and then find the area under that curve. So it's 3, so at time equals 0, the force is 3 newtons, and then the slope is 2. The 
so that after one second, um, we would guess that the force here might be five newtons. Okay, so it starts out then at three newtons, then at time equals zero, then it, uh, over one second, it increases by two uh, newtons to five newtons. Okay, so that means that we know now that F of zero equals three newtons and f of 1 equals 5 newtons. We don't necessarily need that to solve this problem, but it helps give us perhaps a little better idea of what is actually taking place in the problem. To, to sketch it out like that and see what's happening. So the integral is just the area under this curve, which I'm going to figure out in a second just using geometry. But let's do the integral first, because that's considered a more elegant way to solve these problems and a more general way that works. So it's going to be 3 plus 2t dt from 0 to 1. So that's going to be 3t plus 2t squared over 2 evaluated from uh, t equals 0 to 1. So that's going to be 3 times 1 plus 1 squared, or 4. And that would have units of kilogram meter per second. Because it has units of mass times velocity, which is kilogram meter per second. You might wonder, is there a better unit than that for impulse? And the answer is no. We haven't, for some reason, done that. Whereas we have no problem calling energy a joule, that's the same thing as a newton meter. Here, we tend to leave momentum as kilogram meter per second. But that's not to say that energy is more fundamental than momentum. Uh, it's just uh, a convention. Okay, so that's the four. That's the area into this curve. And so now we can double check that that is in fact the area into the curve by taking the area of this rectangle, this is 3 times 1 base times the height plus 1 half the base, which is 1, times the height, which is 2. So that's 3 plus 1 equals 4. So sure enough, the area under the force versus time curve is the same as the value that we got by performing the integral. So that's going to equal mv final minus mv initial. So this is our impulse then, is the 4. And so just solving this in terms of v final, we can say that j plus mv initial equals mv final, or v final equals j over m plus v initial. So the j is the 4 kilogram meter per second divided by m, which is 2 kilograms, plus v naught, which is 2 meters per second. So that gives us uh, 2 plus 2 is 4 meters per second for v final. Okay, so that is uh, the way that we can solve a problem in which a variable force acts over a time by integrating the force versus time function, finding the area under the curve, and setting that equal to the change in the momentum. Now another kind of problem that we often run into is one in which the external force is zero. And so we saw this a lot in the work in energy expressions. So what if what if the F external is zero? Well that tells us that the change in the momentum is zero. But the change in the momentum 
being zero means that the length of the momentum vector doesn't change. Is this always true? No. If there is an external force, then that adds momentum to the system. So there is more momentum or less momentum, depending on how the force is acting after than before. But if there's no external force, then the masses within the system are, uh, uh, are going to have the same momentum vector length as they did before the collision. So an example of this would be uh, a mass is moving at 2 meters per second and collides with a stationary mass. Let's find the final velocity of the two masses if they stick together. So we can take a look at that over here. And for the moment, let's say that one of the masses is heavier than the other. Let's say MB is 2 kilograms and MA is 1 kilogram. Okay, so this mass moves along, they collide, and they move together. During this collision process, if they stick together, this is called an inelastic collision because of the fact that they are uh, moving as a unit afterwards and they don't bounce off of each other. Whereas if it were elastic collision, they would tend to bounce off of each other. And so that would be a different kind of problem. But we can define any problem in which the masses stick together as being inelastic. Whereas an elastic collision means that there's no energy lost in the collision. So here we have energy loss, but it's an unknown amount of energy. Now, a problem where the masses stick together is not the only kind of inelastic collision that we're going to see, but it's one of the main ones that uh, can get us used to the whole concept of how to work with something that's elastic versus something that's inelastic. And so in this problem then, let's assume that uh, mass A is moving toward mass B Let's say mass A is one kilogram and mass B is two kilograms. Okay, then what does this sum of momentum vectors equals zero mean to us in this problem? Well, it means that the sum of the initial momentum vectors must equal the sum of the final momentum. And this is called conservation of momentum. That's a vector sum. So remember before when uh, our 
external forces were zero in a work energy problem, the uh, sum of the initial uh, energies, which was a scalar quantity, equaled the sum of the final energies. That was conservation of energy. Here at the conservation of momentum, we have to add up vectors. So it's the sum of the momentum vectors before the collision equals the sum of the momentum vectors after the collision. And so what have we got here? Then? Well, the sum of the initial momentum vectors is MA VA0 plus MB VB0. So that'll equal, after the collision, MA VA final plus MB VB final. That because they stick together, that means that VA final equals VB final. And we could call that then V final. So we could rewrite this equation then as MA VA zero plus MB VB zero equals MA plus MB times V final. And then what we're asked for in this problem was the final velocity of the two masses. They stick together, meaning that the V final is the same for both of them. And for this particular example, VB0 is 0. VA0 was uh, 2 meters per second. All right? So that gets rid of that term. And this, uh, then if I want to draw this out, then MAVA initial has to equal MAV final plus MBV final. Okay, so the two momentum vectors added together using vector addition afterward has to be the same as the initial momentum vector. And that's what this equation represents, is that the length of these two vectors, the sum of the initial momentum vectors, vector sum is the same as the final momentum vectors, vector sum. And so this gives us then V final equals MA divided by MA plus MB times V initial. All right, so MA, remember, was one kilogram. MB was two, so it's one kilogram plus two kilograms, or one-third times V initial. And so V initial, then, was two meters per second. That's one-third times two, or V final is two-thirds meters per second. Okay, so we just solved this equation using the principle of conservation momentum. Now, in order to implement this equation, we have to justify that there are no external forces acting. You go, well, wait a minute here. There are forces acting because mass A is slamming into mass B. So there must be forces happening here. There must be a force of MB pushing back on MA and a force of MA pushing on MB. But within the system, those forces cancel because of Newton's third law, action-reaction. And so if we look up at the data projector for a second, we can see the plot of these internal forces. And we see that they do, in fact, the force that's the action force and the reaction force add to zero, point by point, because of Newton's third law. So within the system, there are no net forces acting. Just like if I tried to pick myself up by my bootstraps, uh, there's going to be no net force that would allow me to do that, because there's always going to be a reaction force that will cancel out the action force. And so that's what we mean there. We don't, we're not saying that there's no forces acting. We're just saying there's no force acting from the outside. There's only internal forces acting. So that, in this case then, 
the final velocity is um, only one-third of what the initial velocity of the mass is. And so, for a problem like this, then we say, well, is energy lost? Can we show that energy is lost? And the answer is yes. Let's show that energy is lost, and let's find out how much energy is lost during this collision. Now, since it's on a horizontal level surface, there's no springs acting, it means that the only kind of energy that we have to keep track of is the kinetic energy. Okay, so the initial kinetic energy is going to be one half ma va initial squared. And there's no mb, I mean there's no kinetic energy for mass b because there's no velocity for mass b. So this is the only source of energy initially in this problem because mass A is the only mass that's moving. So that this is going to be one half times uh, MA which is one kilogram times VA squared that's two meters per second squared. So that gives us four divided by two is two joules. So that's our initial kinetic energy. So now what we need to do is find the final kinetic energy and if what I'm saying here is true that energy is lost, what we're going to expect is that the final kinetic energy is going to be less because energy has been lost. It's not been destroyed. It goes into heat, friction, uh, frictional losses, stuff like that. Things that we'll deal with more when we get to thermodynamics. So that energy can still be useful, or it can just be wasted energy. It depends on the problem. But K final will be one half times, since they're moving together, I'll just write this as the total mass, MA plus MB times V final squared. So that'll be one half times one kilogram plus two kilograms times two-thirds meters per second squared. So that's going to be three-halves times, here, yeah, this is going to be four over nine. Three over nine is three, so that's going to be the same thing as four over, uh, this is three, so this could be two, two-thirds joules. Okay, so that's all we have left at the end is two-thirds joules. We started out with two joules of energy and we only have two-thirds left. Okay, so we can see then that the percent en energy lost if we lost it all then um, KU final would be at zero. Okay, but here we can say that the uh, percent energy loss is going to be delta kinetic energy divided by KE zero times 100. Okay, so the change in kinetic energy then, delta KE, it's going to be two joules minus two thirds joules. So that's going to be six thirds minus two thirds is four thirds joules. Okay, so then the percent energy loss is going to be four thirds joules divided by two joules times a hundred. Or 4 divided by 2 is 2, so that's uh, 2 thirds times 100 is 66.6%. .6%. Okay, so in other words, we lost 
two-thirds of the energy. We went from six-thirds joules, and then we finished up at only two-thirds joules. Two-thirds, four-thirds, six-thirds. So we lost twice as much of the energy, and there's only one-third as much of that energy left behind after the collision. So again, that energy could go into the form of heat uh, or whatever, uh, but it's no longer in the system. And also, we didn't know how much energy that was. So how are we going to solve a problem if we don't know how much energy is lost? If we use the conservation of energy equation, we can't do it. There's just not enough information. But if we use the conservation of momentum equation first, we don't lose momentum during a collision. Okay? And so I could take this calculator, for example, put it back in the case so it doesn't get too destroyed, and I'll slide it on this, this table. Okay, so I slide it on the table, uh, we can say that uh, there was some initial momentum to begin with, at the end, it looks like that momentum's been destroyed. But has it really? The answer is no. This momentum has just been delivered to the whole Earth. So I've just changed the rotation rate of the Earth slightly with this sliding action. But while the sliding action has taken place, all of the kinetic energy was lost. Okay, and so the energy left the system, but the momentum, if we consider the Earth to be a part of the system, is still, uh, the, all that momentum is still there. And so, how is it then that we can say that the momentum stays the same before and after, even if we lose energy? Well. Let's start something moving, okay? Let's say that that object is the result of some collision with some other object. Then inside of here, we've got molecules. And those molecules can be modeled as masses connected to springs. Okay, and so when we have heat, and that energy, let's say that we slide along a surface to rest, then these molecules start moving faster. And that's because the energy that was associated with the kinetic energy of the molecules has turned into vibrational energy, of the <coughs> which is internal energy, of the molecules that are vibrating more rapidly about their equilibrium position. And so that's what we say, when, and then you touch it, then your molecules in your finger can start to vibrate like that too, and it can even cause a burn. And so you say, well, that thing's hot. You know? But that's because its internal energy has increased. Okay? And so we say then that energy can be lost into this form of heat. It hasn't been destroyed, but it can be turned into heat. <coughs> but can momentum be lost in that same way? <clears throat> well, if we look at this molecule as it's vibrating back and forth, when it's going this way, it's got a positive momentum. When it's going this way, it's got a negative momentum. Now with energy, we didn't care, because energy goes like one half mv squared. So it doesn't matter whether the velocity is negative or positive. It's still going to be a positive energy as it vibrates back and forth. But with momentum, the vectors, this thing is going to time average so that the positive and the negative momentum vectors over a cycle of vibration are going to add to zero. No matter where you are in the motion, this is going to be a smaller momentum vector if it's just starting up, but when it picks up speed, it's going to be going faster and then it's going to slow down toward the end. But still, when it's on this end, it's going to have an equal and opposite momentum vector so they're going to tend to cancel. So that means that changing the vibrational rate of this thing doesn't change its momentum content, because the momentum vectors time average to zero. <clears throat> but 
but the energy, which is a scalar, ah, okay, and so uh, you can lose energy to heat. But the momentum vector is time average to zero, and this means that you can't have momentum be invested in the internal motion of the molecules. So you can't lose momentum to heat. So this is a very important uh, way in which we can distinguish between what kinds of problems we would want to use the energy and work uh, equations for and which ones we would want to use the impulse and momentum equations for. And uh, so uh, let me give you an example that is kind of a classic example. It's called the ballistic pendulum. And this will show when you can use momentum and when you can use energy. Because it uses both in the same problem. So with this ballistic pendulum, let's say that we've got a mass, let's say one kilogram mass hanging from a string. And then we've got a one gram bullet moving with a velocity of 10 to the 3 meters per second, 1,000 meters per second, and, but it's only one gram. It slams into this mass and sticks to it. So this is an inelastic collision. We know energy is going to be lost. And then the system swings up to some height h after the collision. So the one gram bullet slams into the big M, and then let's find h max. Uh, for the uh, bullet block system. Okay, so one of the biggest mistakes that I see uh, in uh, students trying to solve a problem like this is to say that the initial kinetic energy of the bullet equals the final potential energy of the bullet and the block. And just go with the conservation of energy all the way through. But as we're going to see here, that gives you just a little tiny error, uh, maybe on the order of about a factor of a thousand, three orders of magnitude uh, wrong <laughs> for uh, this problem if you just do that. Because in elastic collision, we saw in the last example, we lost two thirds of the energy. In this case, we're going to lose almost all of the energy during the collision. Not quite all of it, but maybe one-tenth of one percent or something is going to be left of the energy. But the momentum is still going to be the same before and after, because you can't lose momentum to heat. And so that's why we want to use momentum conservation during the collision. So let's do that first. You could say that before the collision, we've got little m here times v naught plus big M times zero equals little m plus big M times v just after the collision. So normally I would call that v final, but during the swing, that's going to be, in the second part of the problem, that'll be the initial velocity for the swing part of the problem. And we we'll use conservation of energy in that part, because it's not going to lose much energy during the swing. 
Okay, so this is conservation and momentum just before the collision and just after the collision. So this gives us then V is going to be little m V naught divided by little m plus big M. And so that's the velocity just after the collision. And the big mass has an initial velocity of zero just before the collision. So this gives us 10 to the minus 3, remember to convert to kilograms, times 10 to the 3 meters per second divided by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms plus 1 kilogram, which I'm going to round off in the denominator. That's 1.001. I'm just going to round that off to 1 because error is like rounding off 9.8 to 10. That's 2% error, and that's just here. That's just one-tenth of 1% 1 error to do that. So this gives us then uh, one meter per second. So it starts out at 10 to the 3 meters per second, but then it hits something that's 10 to the 3 times bigger. Okay, and so uh, that gives rise then to a, uh, a trade-off then, where this is three, three orders of magnitude bigger than that, and so this then is going to be three orders of magnitude smaller, and uh, little m plus big M is going to be big, and V final is small. Here, the mass is small, V initial is big. So you have your momentum vectors. Here's little m times V naught, and then afterward, here we have little m plus big M times V final. But the two momentum vectors have the same length before and after the collision. Okay, so this is one meter per second. Now in step two, let's use energy conservation during the swing. So what we can do then in step two is write uh, little m plus big M times one half times V squared, that's the initial kinetic energy, plus the initial potential energy, which is little m plus big M G Y naught equals one half little m plus big M times V final squared plus little m plus big M G times H, or Y final. Okay, so this is our H, or Y final value here. Remember again that as this thing moves along its circular arc path, we are not concerned with the actual path taken, but just in the vertical change in uh, our y coordinate, you know, which in this case is the height that we're trying to solve for. Okay, so I can call this point here y initial equals zero, and I can call this point here y final equals h. And so the y initial goes away here, and there's no v final because we want the maximum height that it reaches. Remember, that's what we're looking for here, is the maximum height of the bullet block system. And so by definition, essentially, we know that that means that the final velocity is zero. Right, so this simplifies to then just loss in kinetic energy, one half little m plus big M times V squared equals gain of potential energy, little m plus big M GH. And little m plus big M's cancel because there's no springs in this problem. And so that gives us H equals V squared over 2G. 
So uh, V then is going to be 1 meter per second squared. Remember we got that again from step 1 where we figured out the velocity of the bullet block system using conservation of momentum just after the collision. Okay, and so then we'll divide that through by 2g, 10 meters per second squared. That gives us 1 20th of a meter. Or I guess that would be like 0 0.05 meters or 5 centimeters. And now there are other variations on the way that this problem could be worked out. We could, uh, we could say that we know the height and we could ask for the initial velocity of the bullet. So if you had that, then you would start out with this equation. You'd work it back down to this velocity. Then you'd take this velocity and you'd plug it back into this expression and find the initial velocity of the bullet. So depending on what's being given in the problem, you can, uh, uh, you can solve this problem uh, in uh, a slightly different order. You can work from the end to the beginning the way that we had it going here. One other thing I wanted to mention in this problem is how much